It's really good to see you all this morning. Uh, we have a lot more to tackle than I can actually get done in the time that we have. And so I'm just going to talk until it, my time is up. We'll see how far we get. How does that sound to you guys uh, today? Um, you never know how God might do a thing. I was in uh, India on a trip to help train some uh, pastors. And uh, while I was there, uh, they rinsed the plates for the meal that we were going to have in the well water behind the church. And uh, just a few drops of water on that plate was all it took. And uh, I became quite ill. I, I lost 10 pounds in the next few days. Uh, couldn't hardly keep anything down. And uh, I still had a lot of speaking assignments, all of which I kept. But I would speak and then I would sleep and, and, and it wasn't the most enjoyable thing. But uh, one of the things that happened was I was introduced to a, a young pastor there. He was a remarkable guy. Uh, his name was Michael. And uh, he had such a heart to plant churches. And he was asking, I was there with a friend of mine, and, and he was asking us to help him know how to go about this. And, and he had so much passion and so much of a heart for this. We weren't really sure what to, to tell him. And so my friend and I walked in. We were looking for a place to get coffee. And, and tea is the more common drink in India. But we found a place that would give us some coffee. Uh, we didn't realize at the time that it was actually a hookah bar. And uh, if those of you who don't know me, my powers of oblivion are just absolutely astounding. Superpower level. And, and somewhere in the conversation, I, I, I noticed, I looked around and noticed that lots of people seemed to be sucking on long pipes and uh, was confused about why that was. And if, in case you're wondering, uh, I, I didn't inhale. That's just a... <laughs> on a napkin, my friend and I wrote out just a very simple plan for that pastor. And um, we gave it to him that night. We didn't even have time to, to transfer it over to a more written form. And he took that napkin and uh, he stopped counting the churches that he planted after 500. Now, I'm not saying that, that you would be impressed with me because you shouldn't be. You should be impressed with him. <laughs> but I was sick as a dog. And what I will tell you is, is that sometimes we assume when things are not going well that we're getting something wrong. And I wish I could tell you that the operations of grace only work in pristine and sanitized environments, but they don't. And so this morning we're going to take a look at how Jesus thinks about this. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 1, it said, When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away. The Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. That phrase when Jesus had finished saying these things shows up five times in the Gospel of Matthew. And each time it's at the end of a significant series of teachings that Jesus does. So the first time that that happens is right after the Sermon on the Mount. The second time is after his Sermon on Mission. The third time it happens is after his Sermon on Parables. The fourth time, the Sermon on Community. And now this time, the Sermon on the End Times. And Matthew's doing this on purpose. It occurred to him as he reflected back on the life of Christ that Jesus had really given five major sets of teachings which is really interesting because Moses had given five major sets of teachings. And so what we're seeing is he's showing everyone Jesus is the new Moses. But now the teaching of Jesus in terms of his public speaking is over. We're not going to get another parable or another lesson from him. So all the lessons that we learn now, we have to learn by observing him and listening to the things that he says with the people that are, he's interacting with. And so the chief priests and the elders gathered in a palace. The high priest at that time, his name was Caiaphas. And the phrase that's used is that Jesus said he would be handed over to be crucified. 
It's really interesting because in the original Greek language, that phrase is going to be used 14 times in two chapters, chapters 26 and 27. 14 times that phrase. How many know if somebody's going to use a phrase, a repeating phrase, 14 times in two chapters, it's something they want you to pay attention to. What does he want us to see? He says he's going to be handed over to be crucified. But what he wants us to know is that it's part of God's plan. It's part of God's plan. Here's the, the thing I'd like you to take away today. Even when it seems like others are in control, God's plans cannot be stopped. Is there anybody in the house today who is grateful that the plans of God cannot be thwarted by foolish or wicked people? Amen? Amen. Now, what's interesting is that phrase, handed over, had very strong memory things for, for the people who heard it. There's a chapter in the Old Testament by Isaiah that used that phrase over and over again. And so Jesus, when he says that, is not just telling them what's going to happen, he's connecting it to scripture. In Isaiah 53, uh, 6, it says it like this, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him, in the Greek language that laid on him, is actually handed over to him the iniquity of us all. And in case you're wondering, I said Greek language. There was a Greek version of the New Testament that, that the religious leaders of that day would have used, not necessarily only the Hebrew. In Isaiah 53, 12, it says, because he poured out his life unto death. That word poured out is the same word as handed over. He poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. He was handed over to death. That's what that phrase says. Isaiah 53, 12, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That, that made intercession is the word handed over. For the sake of transgressions, he was handed over. Matthew's driving home the point. Something tied to scripture is occurring right here. And the reference indicates this is all part of God's plan. It's not a mistake. It's not a miscalculation. Many modern scholars of the New Testament think that uh, the, the language has been edited over time as though Jesus didn't really know that there, he was going to be crucified and that he was going to die, that it caught him by surprise. And some of them teach and preach that because of things that will happen later in this chapter. But Jesus was not surprised by this. Now, what's interesting is that in the Old Testament, the phrase handed over had very strong tones of judgment. Like, you weren't usually handed over for a good reason. In fact, often you would hear this, the people of God were, were guilty of violating the commandments of God, were abandoning the covenant of God, and the phrase in scripture that would frequently be used is, so God handed them over to, and then maybe it was an enemy, or maybe it was a drought, or what, all, all the ways that things could go wrong in a person's life and in a nation's life, he handed them over. So it had very strong judgment tones. Paul would talk about this in, in the Gospel of Romans. This is, this is what he says. Uh, Romans uh, uh, 1, verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over. He handed them over to, in the sinful desires of their hearts. Right? That, that's a judgment overtone. Verse 26, same chapter. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. He handed them over to their own wicked desires. In, in verse 28, same chapter. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over, handed them over to a depraved mind so that they might do what ought not to be done. Being handed over by God is the worst thing that can happen to someone. That's the context of that word. God is going to hand over his son to death. But his son, Jesus, is participating willingly. This is not outside of his will. We're, we're going to see by the end of the chapter, he's wrestling with his will and God's will. But he submits humbly to the will of God. He's a, he has a decision and he decides that he will do God's will. He understood and undertook the mission willingly. Human beings participated in this of their own free will. 
No one was forced to do by God. God doesn't program people to do things that are harmful or destructive to other people. That's not how God works. But God does understand what's in the heart of human beings. And so the church doesn't just simply say that humans have rejected Jesus. What the church basically says is that the Son of Man was handed over to Jesus, handed over Jesus so that humans could do their rejecting work. Because this is what humans do. And, and this challenges how we think about religion. Now what's interesting is that in this passage you have the religious elite and they're gathered in a palace. If you were going on vacation, how many think it might be a better accommodations to stay in a palace? Huh? Nobody. Okay. <laughs> My last vacation was in a tent in the rain. A palace would have been better. <laughs> <laughs> They're in a palace, but they are scheming to have Jesus arrested secretly and then killed. They are exercising their will for destruction, and Jesus is exercising his will for salvation. And all of this is happening at the same time. This is what they said, but not during the festival because we don't want to riot. Interestingly enough, in their secret scheming, they seem more bound by their own plans than Jesus is. Jesus is the one who's going to be arrested, he's going to be tried, he's going to be crucified, and in the whole story, he's the most free person. He says, he speaks truth, he's not afraid. So even when it seems like others are in control, God's plans cannot be stopped. Continuing on in verse six, it says, while Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will have with you always, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. The religious leaders are plotting murder in a palace, and Jesus and his followers are actually in the house of a person who had been a leper, who had been considered an outcast. Obviously, by this point, this person had been healed. But isn't it interesting how Jesus is always comfortable with the people who are needy and who are struggling in life? And, and in case you wonder, sometimes people think that Christianity has a dim view of women. It's not true. Lots of places in our world and lots of people in our world have a dim view of wit, uh, women, but, but not scripture. Uh, the, the, the whole Christmas story actually started with a woman named, named Mary, right? And, and the whole passion story now, because now we're going to enter into the passion of Jesus, it starts with a woman who anoints him. And, and her name is not given here, but historically people believe it's a woman named Mary from Bethany. And, and also when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, it'll be women who begin the resurrection story. There are some people who think that the, the, the New Testament has been scrubbed so that men can, can, can make themselves look better. If that was true, this story would not be in the scripture. The disciples don't come off looking very good. Like this is a serious flaw in editing because there's a woman who's doing something good for Jesus and they are all indignant. They are furious. What we see in scripture is evidence of the disciples' failure, but it also reflects the grace of God. Is there anybody in the house that's actually glad this morning that your failure can be a reflection of God's grace, the way he operates with us? Amen? Amen. Amen. So this woman poured out very expensive perfume on Jesus, and the disciples are furious, and, and they, they ask a question, why this waste? 
Why this waste? Now, if you remember last week, Jesus had just done a message on taking care of the poor and the people were going to be separated, the sheep from the goats. And, and, and because you, you took care of me when I was poor and when I was naked and when I was hungry and when I was sick and when I was in prison. And they said, when did we ever do that? And he said, when you've done it for the least of these. So the disciples have kind of latched onto that teaching and suddenly they have a, a whole expanded view of social justice. And now they see this incredible waste of perfume that was worth uh, uh, easily over a hundred days of wages. It's just unbelievably expensive perfume. And, and in their mind, that could have been used for the poor. And they're all upset about it. And Jesus, they ask, why this waste? And Jesus asks a different question to the disciples. Why this hurt? Why do you insist on hurting this woman who wants to do a good thing? The disciples' frustration could easily have crushed this woman. Now, this woman didn't know that she was anointing Jesus unto his burial. And back in that day, that was considered a very sacred and highly esteemed responsibility. Not only is Jesus connecting his disciples back to the fact that he's going to die, but he's also telling them this woman is doing something that is considered a very high esteem in our culture. The truth is Jesus just sees things differently than we do. And even here, Jesus quotes scripture, the poor you have with you always. Some people use that as an excuse to not do anything for the poor. You're always going to have the poor. You're never going to be able to solve the poverty problem, so you might as well just live your life. But that's not what that passage of scripture means. In Deuteronomy, the 15th chapter, this is where that passage comes from. Listen to what it says. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. Uh, there's actually another danger that's present here. And that danger is that sometimes if we do anything other than help the poor, it's considered super spiritual or emotional. And that the only real thing the church should be doing is just helping the poor. The church can do both. We can serve those who are poor and powerless, and we can acknowledge the glory of a God who has saved us. We don't have to choose. Our job is both. So Jesus uses the situation to remind his disciples, when they poured, when she poured this perfume on my body, she did to prepare me for burial. It's interesting. Jesus actually appreciates those who honor him from their heart. Then in verse 14, it says, then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot. Now, even if you are not familiar with scripture, you probably already know Judas is not a good guy in the story. We are going to dedicate four children this morning. None of them named Judas. There's a reason for that, right? Uh, one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you, if I hand him over? <laughs> so they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Matthew wants us to see a contrast between a woman's devotion and a disciple's betrayal. It's happening in the same place. And I don't know what it was about this event, but it was the last straw for Judas. The world wasn't going to be changed by wasted perfume. He wasn't just disappointed in Jesus and he was going to walk away and go back to whatever his previous life had been. He was angry with Jesus and he's going to He's going to make sure that this loser loses fatally. That's quite a turn. And we know it's connected because of the word then. Then Judas begins to look for an opportunity to hand him over. To him, Jesus was a loser. What will you give me? What will you give me if I hand him over? 30 pieces of silver. Judas doesn't know. Right now, he's part of God's plan. 
He thinks he's, he's just acting out of his own frustration and his own anger. There's, there's been a lot of speculation through the ages about what motivated Judas, and we don't know because he didn't tell us. We don't know. But in case you're wondering, 30 pieces of silver is not a huge amount of money. It's not the kind of thing that would, would change your life. It was a small fraction of what that perfume was worth. But we do know from a couple of references in scripture that it was considered an, an insignificant sum. There was an Old Testament prophet by the name of Zechariah, and he was considered a spiritual shepherd. And he had been working and serving for God's people who were by and large very greedy, and they wouldn't listen to anything that he had to say. And so finally he tells them, fine, why don't you just pay me what you think I'm worth, and I'll go away. And they give him 30 pieces of silver, and that is because they wanted it to be an insult. In fact, in, in Exodus, the 21st chapter, it tells us what the value of a wounded servant was. What's the value of a servant who can no longer perform his duties? He's been, he's been involved in an accident and can't do it. His value was 30 pieces of silver. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus directed and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad began to say to him one after the other, surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, you have said so. Jesus is aware there's a betrayer in the room. And he acknowledges it, and everyone is immediately sad. And everyone began to ask a, a, a question, right? Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Surely you don't mean me. Uh, Judas had a slightly different response. Did you catch it? Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus was not his Lord. You know, we come to a point when we honor the Lord's table and we come to celebrate communion, to remember what Jesus has done for us. There's an opportunity for self-reflection. And so many people think that if I feel guilty about a sin I've committed, that I shouldn't partake of communion. Would you please hear this? Communion is not a reward for being good. Communion is a reminder of the grace that we also desperately need. That's what it's for. That's what it's for. But it's an opportunity to examine ourselves and not just to say in what, in what way did I do something that I shouldn't have done or that I'm embarrassed by or that violates the teachings of Jesus. It goes a little bit deeper than that. In what areas of my life is Jesus just an interesting teacher instead of being the Lord of my life? What areas of my life have, not, have I not submitted and surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus? It's an opportunity to remember his lordship. It's an opportunity to experience forgiveness where we have failed. It's an opportunity to experience wholeness where there has been brokenness. It communicates such a powerful thing. And then Jesus is going to celebrate Passover. And, and Passover is, is an, an interesting holiday in the Jewish calendar. Now, Jesus is actually going to eat his Passover with his followers on Thursday night. It's after dark, after the sun is set. So that's considered part of the Passover, which would be the next day. So he celebrates Passover with them on Thursday. But very interestingly, he is going to die on the day of Passover itself. This is no accident. God wants us to know what's going on. It goes all the way back to when the nation of Israel were slaves for hundreds of years in the land of Egypt. Their agenda was not anything they ever decided. 
They would wake up every single morning and at the end of, uh, of, of uh, Taskmaster with a whip, that's where they would be told what they were going to do and how long that day. There were no days off. There were no holidays. There were no celebrations. It was just demands, unending, every day. And God had sent Moses back to tell, to tell Pharaoh in the land of Egypt to let his people go. They were going to go and worship the true and the living God. And Pharaoh resisted that. And God unleashed a series of plagues. But the last plague is the one that's really interesting. Because what he said is that there would go a destroyer throughout the entire land. And it would go with such incredible speed and force that no military power, even though Egypt was the greatest military power in the world at that time, they wouldn't be able to even slow it down, much less stop it. And in every single house, there would be the firstborn of that house would die. I wish I had time to go into all the reasons why that was important. But I think there's a couple things that we can say, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. There's a couple things that we can say about that. And, and, and the first is this, is that that Passover option, that destroyer going through wasn't just for the Egyptians. That would happen in the Israelite households too. They were not exempt. The judgment of God is not based on our ethnicity. God's people were told, if you don't want the destroyer to come and take the life of the firstborn son, then you're to take a lamb and you're to kill the lamb. You're to eat it, cook it and eat it, but you're to take its blood and you're to put it on the doorpost, the doorframe of the house. And when the destroyer comes through, he'll see that death has already occurred at this house and he'll move on. And so the picture of, of Passover is a picture of two things. It's a picture of judgment and it's a picture of freedom. Now, I, I know there are people who are deeply offended by this kind of thinking, especially in the modern world. I mean, dear God, a blood sacrifice, is that what we really are? We've, we've descended from that kind of thinking. Well, before we get on our high horses, um, I will go home and I will eat today. And at some point, so this might offend a couple of you. Uh, there will be an animal that has given up its life so that I can eat. Any other animal eaters in the house? You have no idea how much trouble you're in with some people. <laughs> what happened? That animal was sacrificed so you could live. So you could have a future. And we understand that. This idea that religion is so separated from the real world. We are all alive in this room today because there has been a sacrifice that was made and we are able to live as a result of it. And sacrifice is actually important because what it says is, is that there is something that is so real in life that I can actually plan on something in the future. It's not just for right now. I'm going to be alive tomorrow because of a sacrifice that was made today. And this is what Jesus is doing. He's going to be the sacrifice. And because of what he is doing, not only is the judgment of God going to come upon him, but freedom is going to come to us. And all the nation of Israel walked out of Egypt after that, and they would walk across the Red Sea, and they would eventually end up in a land of promise, and they wouldn't have taskmasters standing over them every single day telling them they had no options to exercise except the directive given by a slave driver. And what Jesus is telling us, what Matthew is telling us, what God wants to remind us is that in Passover, this is what God is doing. The judgment of God is coming upon Jesus. He is the sacrifice. And because of his sacrifice, not only are our sins forgiven, but we get to live a free life because of it. Is there anybody in the house who thinks that's a really good thing? That's a really good thing. Heavenly Father, you have been so good to us. So good to us.
thank you. Thank you for handing your son over. That he handed himself over so that we would live and experience the freedom you always intended for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.